the state of Maryland, uh, near the Chesapeake Bay, uh, in tidewater country, with um, a big appreciation for the land and the water. My um, mom was a, uh, had a third generation uh, resident of the eastern shore of Maryland, and uh, my father had moved there from Pittsburgh in the 30s. He um, had been a prisoner of war with the Japanese for two and a half years, and was perhaps changed so much by that event, I don't really know, but he was a very quiet man, and my best times with him were either on a sailboat or walking the land. And he would talk to me about whose farm, whose farm this was, and we had a, about 200 acres of mixed farmland that was farmed by somebody else. Um, but it was a great experience, and I think that it gave me an appreciation for um, geography and later for anthropology that I carried with me all the way through my life. I um, went to private schools, uh, had the fairly privileged childhood, um, and um, it was a, the private school I attended was in Southern Virginia, uh, which was quite a contrast to where I had spent my early years. It was still a time of segregation, and it was my introduction to activism, really, when I uh, uh, protested to the Board of Trustees that it was time to uh, include um, people of color in the school. And now there are many, and that school is still going strong. Mm, I remember as a child always being drawn to expect or hope for an adulthood that was different from what my peers wanted. Um, probably like many other anthropologists, I never felt I really fit in. Um, and, and yet I was, I was fascinated with people. So I didn't know what I would become. Uh, at one point I was extremely disappointed to learn that women could not become priests in the Anglican Church. Uh, in fact, I was not only disappointed, but angry about that, but not, I guess, angry enough to go ahead and change the system, which some of, of my generation did. Uh, I just knew that I didn't want to uh, marry an insurance broker. No, some people are nice insurance brokers, but and lead a real bourgeois lifestyle on the eastern shore of Maryland. My mother loved to travel, but it was only in her later years that she traveled um, well, now she, as a teenager, she had traveled with her mother outside the U.S., and then in her later years she did. But um, her travels with us uh, did broaden my horizons, and one of the big uh, memories from my childhood was traveling to Vermont in the summer for holiday, and here, crossing the border into Canada and hearing French spoken by native speakers. And I had never heard a foreign language. Uh, and it, I loved it. <laughs> and uh, it, it increased my curiosity about uh, other ways of life. Um, I went to Goucher College, which was at that time a girls' college. It's now co-ed in Maryland, in Baltimore, Maryland, on the outskirts of Baltimore. It was a very um, activist college. I was there from 1960s. So I graduated from high school in 65, so 65 to 69 doing um, a bachelor's degree in political science. Um, the Vietnam was, war was uh, uh, in its heyday, and I remember marching on the Pentagon and getting tear gassed, uh, which at the time was an unpleasant experience, but much for many, many years, I've been very pleased to say that I got tear gassed at the Pentagon. Uh, I kind of wish I'd been arrested, although at the time that was not what I wanted. Um, but now, amongst our age group, uh, there's a cer certain um, cachet in having been arrested for civil disobedience. Um, I enjoyed political science and was quite fascinated by it. I also found it didn't meet my um, needs, I guess, uh, for a professional career in that it was too removed from the, the grassroots. Um, what really interested me, and I, I see now that I could have done political science at a grassroots level, but at the time it was very fo focused on nation uh, or state, um, and that just wasn't where my energy wanted to flow. So when I met Bill Rodman in 1967, 
teaching for the summer at my old boarding school in Virginia, where his mother had also been a student in the 30s. Um, and learned, and he was there teaching anthropology. I was teaching English, or a, I was a teaching assistant to an English teacher. And I learned um, that he was a PhD student in anthropology at the University of Chicago, and planned to do his field work in Melanesia, which I had never heard of. Um, and that um, he was looking at uh, a traditional society and interested in how men achieved rank and leadership in that society, I thought, ooh, I'd really like to go there. And, uh, and he was pretty fascinating too. And so, although our backgrounds were similar, uh, his interest in taking me to Melanesia appalled my parents. And, uh, and yet they, what appalled them even more was the thought that I would go without marrying him. Uh, and in, in any case, uh, I graduated, f I, I was living with him in Chicago the last year that I was at Goucher College, and so I completed my coursework for my bachelor's degree at the University of Chicago, which was a great opportunity, uh, And because uh, some of the leading figures in political science were there. Um, there I became familiar with the work of David Easton, who was actually a Canadian political scientist working on systems theory. Uh, and which led to an interest that, in, that I've had in cybernetics and in um, the communication of knowledge and language um, and in how systems maintain resilience. So those courses in political science um, also gave me a curiosity about anthropology. We left for Va what is now Vanuatu, was then the New Hebrides, um, about six months, I guess, after I graduated from Goucher College, so in the fall of 1969. And that began another chapter of my life. Um, I had not made a decision about going to graduate school at that time. Um, the ink was barely dry on my BA. But um, doing, going along with Bill and do, assisting with his fieldwork in Vanuatu um, really opened me to the possibility of, of doing a master's degree, at least in, in anthropology. Um, we, I'm just thinking, yeah, so um, we arrived in um, Melanesia, my introduction to Melanesia, uh, from Sydney on a uh, thir uh, traveling third class on a messagerie maritime ship called the Caledonian. Uh, it was a great journey. I like to think it took weeks, but I think it took days, maybe a week at all, uh, from Sydney through uh, New Caledonia to, uh, Van to Port Vila, then Santo, um, and back to Port Vila, where we finally cleared customs. We had to find customs to clear it. The um, New Hebrides are a chain of about 80 islands in a Y-shaped formation, and they run between the Solomon Islands to the north, down toward New Caledonia, creating the Coral Sea, New Guinea, um, the Solomon Islands, and then Vanuatu and New Caledonia uh, enclose what is known as the Coral Sea. They, the New Hebrides, at that time had a population of about 80,000 people. It's over 200,000 now. They um, were colonized by, and I use that word with some hesitation, by both Britain and France, and never divided. So the territory was never carved up. It was administered as a uh, Anglo-French condominium and was really the only state of its kind in the world. The Anglo-Egyptian Sudan was similar, but um, not the, it w did not have the parity that France and England had as partners in an administration. Um, so it, was, it has often been um, called the pandemonium because it was so incredibly inefficient. Uh, it was quite uh, extraordinary bureaucracy. So we cleared English customs, and we cleared French customs, and we cleared, you know, talked to the native system too. There were three courts of law, three systems of justice, three courts of law, French, English, and uh, the native court. 
Um, the French code was Napoleonic. The British was common law. They were entirely different, uh, and yet they somehow managed to uh, jointly administer the condominium of the New Hebrides. That later became a, a big interest of mine when I did colonial research, um, uh, on, on mostly on the English, but also on the French uh, history of the country. So we um, settled in, on Ambai, which is in the north of the country. It was an island about eight miles long and four miles wide, something like that, with a volcano in the middle, uh, and two different languages, because the volcano, the lava flows, had uh, made it very difficult to walk from one end of the island to the other. And uh, so the people really only had uh, interactions with each other if they came by boat. They were not big, um, it was not a real maritime community as many in the Solomons, in contrast to many in the Solomons, say. Uh, people did have canoes, but they didn't, they were not real comfortable on the sea, as I remember from some boat trips uh, where people were desperately seasick. Uh, and um, so people uh, on the east end of the island spoke a, a language that was more like another island, but not like the other end of their island. Um, we uh, arrived in time for Christmas 1969 and stayed until February uh, 1971 in um, a hamlet, really, um, that had a church. So it, it was an aggregation of little hamlets called Navonda uh, along the coast, which was where the local missionary had suggested that we go. Um, the missionary had also uh, concurred with Bill's plan to study the graded society, uh, and so that's what we did. Um, I'm going to go into that fieldwork a little bit more here and then come back to the gra my graduate school and my sort of intellectual house. Um, that fieldwork period was unique in our experience in that we were isolated from um, uh, other non-Nivanu, non so indigenous people of Vanuatu are called Nivanuatu, and I'll use that term even during the period when they were um, New Hebrideans. Uh, so that we, were in, we were the only um, white people on the island except for um, four or five people of New Zealand and English um, background at the mission station, which was eight miles away. Our only transportation was our feet. So uh, we were effectively there on our own uh, with the, the hospitality, the incredibly generous hospitality of the people in the village that we lived. Uh, they um, invited us in. I mean, we asked around to different villages and they said, yes, please come here. Uh, we stayed there and initially had no garden, so we were dependent on their hospitality for our, much of our food. We had plenty of tin things, but for our fresh food, um, so we engaged in reciprocity, tin fish for just about anything. Uh, but it was the only period of fieldwork where we didn't have access to fresh produce um, from a garden, uh, and where we didn't leave the field site, um, I think it was a year before we left for any kind of a break. Uh, so that meant that, and we didn't know the language. That was the other thing that it gives me this sense that we were quite isolated. Uh, there were no written, there was, I lie, there was one written dictionary of Bislama, and it was in French, and my French at that time was a lot better than it is now, uh, but it still was a bit of a stretch, um, and there was no grammar. Um, the, gra the Longana language, a Bible had been translated in it, but that was it. And so we really felt our way, uh, and it was total immersion. Uh, perhaps if, it, if we had been single field workers, it would have been even more of an immersion and a more successful story. We became very fluent in Bislama, but never as fluent in the Longana language. I, I have a huge vocabulary and not much grammar. Uh, and an ability to, or had an ability to understand what was going on, but there's a real reluctance among native speakers in our, at least where we were, to adventure into languages that they're really um, he have any hesitancy about. So people wouldn't 
uh, practice speaking the language of the next place over. And I guess I was intimidated into not wanting to practice as much as I should have. So that's a regret that I have, that I was never fluent in the Longana language. Nevertheless, um, I became quite close with many of the women there, and that was a, a lovely way of trying out anthropology. Uh, Bill found that the women la giggled and held their hands up to their faces and giggled whenever he said anything to them. Uh, and that was frustrating to him, and I don't know what it was to them, perhaps entertaining. Uh, but I could sit with them for hours and hear stories, and I learned to weave mats and make baskets and learned the cures for this and that. Uh, and uh, one of my first fieldwork exercises was, and I think I still have a copy of this book, uh, taken straight out of the pages of the craft of social anthropology, and it was Barnes, John Barnes' approach to doing genealogies, how to collect a genealogy. One of the things that frustrated me about anthropology was that there was very little on the how-to side, very little methodology. Uh, it was it was abstract the methodology, it was, but there wasn't anything about so how do you take a genealogy. Uh, how do you do a census? How do you do an interview? Now there's, fortunately, a whole lot of material. And as I went on to teach methods courses, I was glad for that. But at the time, this was what I had. So I had one finger in the book on how to take the genealogy. And with, the, with my clipboard, I was taking notes on old women who many of them could, could give me four generations of kin terms and relatives. So, and I liked to do graphics, so I diagrammed it all. They're all in color, and I have since returned them to the Cultural Center in Vanuatu, because I think they're archives, uh, and, uh, or artifacts. So, that was uh, where I started learning. I learned anthropology by doing it, uh, and I did it by the seat of my pants, because I was doing uh, research that Bill wasn't particularly trained in either, because they didn't have training in that, uh, and it wasn't really his interest. So my work was almost almost entirely with women on that trip, uh, and on subsequent trips I worked more with men, and then my last field work was entirely with women. So it suggests a kind of range that I covered. The um, his dissertation was on uh, men of influence. It was called Men of Influence, Men of Rank, uh, and it was about leadership uh, in a northern New Hebridean society. Uh, we went to many, many pig killing ceremonies. Uh, we recorded the sounds of many, many pigs dying, which is an awful noise. Um, we danced, Dennis Daylight is what they call it. We danced until daylight after those ceremonies, which was a joyful thing to do, and learned that the sound, the volcanic earth is a drum and it reverberates in this uh, counter puntal melodies, the uh, rhythms that they have with the, with the slit gongs, the hollowed out um, tom toms. Uh, and that was gorgeous. And uh, when we came back from that experience, I knew that I wanted to um, pursue a career in anthropology, which was something Bill encouraged as well. There were, at that time, quite a few husband and wife couples doing anthropology. It was a logistical challenge, in fact, to do extended periods of fieldwork if your partner was in some other career especially a non-portable career. So there were certainly um, other anthropologists who's, uh, I think of John Barker, whose uh, spouse was a nurse, uh, who had more portable careers where they could find work in Papua New Guinea or Vanuatu. But it was a challenge for other people. And so we saw this as a big asset and, uh, and a way to you know, continue to have great conversations about uh, the work that we were doing and what we were observing, which was, is a real benefit of, of families in the field. So we came back to Chicago. It was 1971. We had planned to stay longer in Vanuatu, but uh, we, got a, we got word, and, and I should add, this is how we got word, by mail. That was it. We had an emergency set up with a short wave, wave radio operator who was one of the local planters so that if my parents had something dire, they could 
use a ham radio where they lived, radio operator where they lived, and contact uh, through the shortwave network and get word to us, contact through this planter. But otherwise, we relied on uh, C-mail, and that meant that letters took three weeks. They probably take that long by airmail now, but they took three weeks to reach us, uh, and that was only if we picked up our mail at the mission station. So we got word that uh, Raymond Firth, Sir Raymond Firth, was going to be at the University of Chicago for the winter term, which began in February there. Uh, And that was just too good an opportunity to pass up. We had heard about him through um, the Oceania Research Network. uh, And I think Bill may have met him in Australia, where he, um, Bill, my husband, did his undergraduate work at the University of Sydney and studied with Michael Allen, who had done fieldwork in Vanuatu on the same island uh, and by as we went to. He had done the West End, so we did the East. Um, And so when we heard that Raymond Firth was going to be at Chicago, we packed our bags and we headed home, uh, arriving in time uh, for me to to plea with him to let me take his graduate seminar on symbolic anthropology, I think it was, um, with... Uh, Barbara Bradshaw, I think her name, Babcock, her name was, a symbolic anthropologist. Uh, Rick Feinberg, who became an ethnographer of the Solomon Islands in Tikopia, uh, where Firth himself had worked. Brad Shore, who went on to, um, to work in Samoa and uh, the California University System. And a couple of other people. Uh, and I had to persuade... Uh, Sir Raymond to let me take this class because I had a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from a college no one had ever heard of. Um, And fortunately, the skill testing questions that he asked me were about kinship. And I could do it because, in fact, that was the only thing I knew. Um, But I passed the test uh, and uh, really got such a huge benefit from that seminar. Uh, He allowed Bill and I to write a paper together um, and to get share a mark. Uh, which uh, was unheard of at the time and was something we wanted to do, so, so that was good. Uh, and uh, from that, I then, uh, then took a few more courses in anthropology and political science. I guess I had been admitted to the graduate school in political science, actually, before we left, but I had deferred it. And so um, I was able, through that access point, to take courses that really weren't political science. Then um, a year later, our son was born, Sean, uh, in the Chicago Teaching Hospital. Um, that about that time, like within that month, Bill was off was on the job market and. He was offered a job um, at Barnard College in New York City and one at uh, McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Well, I mentioned the war in Vietnam earlier when I was an undergraduate student. It was still going on in 1972. um, And for that reason, Canada had a certain appeal because Bill was draftable. Uh, Also, uh, we were tired of living in Chicago. at some point that, around that time, uh, we had this newborn baby lying on a blanket in the sunlight, the winter sunlight coming in through the window, and some kid in the neighborhood fired, uh, I guess it was a pellet gun, through the window, and broke the window above our sleeping baby. And it was just time to leave. It was just time to leave. Um, so we took the job uh, at McMaster, and um, I... Uh, that's began a whole nother chapter in my life. 